Jonathan, the Wisconsin sports collector. We're going to talk about 1962 and 1963 Milwaukee Braves stuff. Let's go. 1962 tops. They made 34 cards with Braves on them. Carl Willie somehow had two different pictures on his card. Bob Uecker's rookie is in here. He joked that the team demanded a signing bonus from his father. His career was a testament to the human spirit, according to him. Uh, Joe Torrey was a rookie catcher this year, too. Tops made 10 Braves stamps. One was a team logo, nicer, than, I think, than the previous year with full color. Tops Bucks had five Braves. Don't even know how you got them, but they came folded. So all of them have a fold mark on them. Now the fun stuff. Aurora Vision Records were released. Gotta be careful with these. They are exactly the same as the 1964s, but the stats on the back are the dead giveaway. The 62 was basically issued as a test. Um, Spawn is the only brave. Bazooka had three card panels on gum boxes to be hand cut. Three braves. Exhibit had four braves with the stats on them, red and black versions of them too. Post went a bit nuts. They made 13 Braves, then they made Canadian versions with some French on them. Both had a misspelled version of Adcock, spelled Adoc. Then the Hank, Ver Hank Aaron card came out with two different versions of the script on the American and the Canadian. Then they put the cards on Jello boxes too, which are just a tiny, tiny bit smaller. I'm not aware of multiple, multiple versions of Jello cards but who knows. The Jello are harder to find than the regular post. Sell out of tea made coins. They put in their boxes of tea to get kids to drink more tea, I suppose. They decided to make 180 players, and then they put the number on the back, collect all 180 players. Then they made the coins of the players and decided they left too many off, so they ended up with a total of 221 players. So that's two, two different versions on the back. Well, except for the players numbered above 180. Or they were in junket pudding, too. They made uh, shields that were plastic, and you could pop the coins into. One for every team. Sheriff coins looked the same, but they were made for the Canadian market, and they say Sheriff on the back. I don't know what Sheriff is, really. 63 tops had quite a lot of Braves in them too. Nice looking with the two pictures on it. In 63 Tops did peel-offs. They're just stickers. Two Braves. <coughs> Spawn and Aaron. Bazooka made just two Braves. <coughs> Exhibit with red backed stats only this time. Had four Braves. Flair went after the few players they could who weren't married to Tops I guess. A very small set, two Braves. Post and Jello cards are back, almost identical again. The Jellos are just a little smaller again, and there's some very fine differences. Uh, ten Braves this time. The Crandall is short printed in the post, but I'm not sure if he's short printed in Jello. Uh, no Canadian versions this year. Uh, Bob Shaw has an error card with a sort of nonsensical line in the script that got fixed. Uh, and that was in both Tops and Jello, I think. I'm not sure. Bob Uecker said that Bob Shaw played, stayed in the big leagues only because he developed a spitball. By the way, Johnny Antonelli made it back to the Braves in 1961. He did not get a card in 61 or 62. Uh, Salada Coins came out with a smaller set this time, and they're metal. The, the year before they were plastic. A uh, smaller set this time, and there's just six Braves. Again. All right, attendance kept dropping. The Great Beer Revolt of 1961 already happened. In mid-62, they reversed it, and you could bring beer back. Well, they already pissed everybody off. Well, 162 games were played in 1962 for the first time. Before this, this is a 154-game uh, a year universe. 
So players that had a lot of time in before 1962 didn't get the chance to set the kind of records or statistics that players from 62 and forward uh, got. Well, the team was also sold. They were sold to Chicago investors, minority owners with the White Sox, and they bought it with borrowed money and they bought it to move. The GM said they'd never move. The owner said they'd never move. They didn't buy it to move them. And they all lied. Of course they bought it to move. Atlanta was a richer market. And Atlanta was gearing up for this thing, you know, already in 1962. Well, you know, you already pissed off everybody with the beer revolt, and then this, the, the rumors were going around uh, it, right away. So, uh, they, there was no chance. The, the, the local ownership group that was formed, Bud Selig, Wally Rank, Edmund Fitzgerald, and others, they eventually became the core ownership of the Brewers, but they wanted to buy the uh, team from the Chicago investors like immediately. They never knew it was for sale. Perrine never told anybody that it was for sale. They just sold it to them without telling anybody. And, uh, very bad situation. They're on their way out. Collector-wise, things are still happening. It, it's a very fun time to collect, I'm sure. At least it is now, looking back on all the stuff they had. But the attitude in Milwaukee was going downhill very fast. 